Speakers, uh, Yaron Brook, uh, Dr. Yaron Brook is the current uh, president of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and has flown here from uh, Puerto Rico to give us a wonderful debate on altruism and how objectivists would view it. And of course, we're joined by Christopher Snowden of the Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, so if you're aware of the sugar tax, the nanny, the spirit level, then you'll know who Chris is. Uh, also, we have uh, Professor Osuka uh, in the corner over here who is uh, going to help keep the peace, hopefully. Um, <laughs> That should be a very interesting uh, example. So, uh, as I said, thank you very much for coming. I would like to hand over, and I hope everyone enjoys. So, I'll start by asking the first question. The first question, and I'll ask Yaron this, and I'll ask Chris. Yaron, what is altruism to you? So, it's not a question of what is altruism to me, it's a question of what is altruism. Um, <laughs> and altruism is a term coined by uh, a French philosopher by the name of Augustine Comte in the, in the 19th century. And altruism is the term that he refers to his moral system. And that moral system basically says that the purpose of an individual's life is to serve others. Your whole focus when it comes to ethics and morality should be how do I help those in need? And it's not about, well, it makes me feel good to help other people, or, or the world is a better place if I help other people. No. Comte actually says, to the extent that you, you're motivated to help other people by some, I'm going to feel good, or it's going to make my life better in some way, then it's out. It's not moral. So any consideration of self, any consideration of self-interest, must be rejected for an action to be moral. It must be selfless, complete. That is the morality of altruism. The morality of altruism is basically a morality of slavery. It's a morality that says that you, your life should be enslaved to anybody who needs something, anybody who has less than you, anybody who is struggling in any kind of way. Your duty, the moral obligation, and you should do it out of a sense of duty, not out of, not out of benevolence, not out of, again, it makes me feel good, but out of a sense of duty, your obligation is to help and assist and give to them. Now, of course, no way is a consideration of what the people who get all this stuff, what their moral status is. I guess they need to turn around and find somebody even more in need than they are and give it all to the next person because otherwise they're not moral. But the idea of your own well-being should, uh, should be taken into account. Now, in that sense, nobody is really an altruist. Or very few people take altruism and, and apply it in that way. Because it's anti-life. I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to die because all you're doing is looking for needy people to help them out. And you can't live and there's no purpose in life. Nobody wants to live like that. So it's not, like most bad philosophies, it's not a philosophy to actually live by. But it's a great philosophy to actually control people by. Because we set this goal, you should live for others. That's what nobility is. That's what morality is. You should be selfless. You should never think of what's good for you. That is what true virtue is. And nobody does it. Oh, you bad people. You should all feel guilty. And hey, I, I know how to reduce your guilt a little bit. Right? Because you're not going to help the needy enough. You're not going to sacrifice enough. I'm here for the government to help you be better people. I'm just going to raise your taxes a little bit. I am just going to control you a little bit more so that I can help the people you should have helped to begin with. So it's a way, at the end of the day, to control people and to get people to do what those in power want them to do. Because at the end of the day, how do we know what the needy want? How do we know who's needy to begin with? 
somebody has to let us know. Somebody has to guide us. Somebody has to tell us whom to sacrifice to and how much to sacrifice to them. And there are plenty of volunteers to guide our altruism and to force us to be altruistic, to accommodate the needs of those that the people in power decide. Um, decide. So to me, altruism is a philosophy very much aimed at controlling us. Uh, it's unachievable. It's aimed at producing guilt. And as any Jewish mother or Catholic mother will tell you, <laughs> guilt is an amiss. Look at people like uh, uh, Gates and uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, Gates recently said in an interview talking about his house that he's not sure if he should feel guilty about how big of a house he has because the house has a room. It's called a trampoline room. All the room is is one big trampoline. Kids go in there and bounce around. I mean, it sounds like unbelievable fun to me. <laughs> and he says, you know, he's not sure he should feel guilty about that. Why should somebody like Bill Gates, who changed the world, right, who made his money, feel guilty about anything that he has? But altruism is the system that inculcates that kind of guilt, particularly in successful people, particularly in people who've <coughs> done a little bit of self-interested stuff, like make money. Okay, well, I have never really spoken or even thought about altruism in any uh, deep way. <laughs> I was launched into this, this evening, which I'm more than happy to do. I know that uh, Yaron has uh, thought about this a great deal before. Um, I, like you, I just came along to see him speak, really. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond as well as I can. What I will say is that certainly altruism is not enough to base a society around or based an economy on and it has long been a problem for socialists and not social collectivists and traditionalists of all sorts that the opposition as, as Hayek said many years ago the opposition or one of the oppositions to capitalism has been that it is not based around altruism it's not based on what is fundamentally a kindly um, and uh, self-sacrificing principle it is based ultimately on rational self-interest, which is not wholly the opposite of altruism, but pretty far away from it. And Adam Smith's famous thing about the butcher, the baker, and so on, um, uh, serving society, making people's lives better because of interest, has never sat well with people. Even before Adam Smith even came up with that analogy, the, the, the very idea that has never sat well. And even today, perhaps especially today, um, Although people may accept that from the point of view of efficiency and progress, actually having the butcher and baker providing for their own self-interest works better than any other system, we only maybe grudgingly accept that. We'd rather there was a way of doing it which was actually based on them caring for, um, for other people. Now, that is not to say that altruism is a bad thing per se, and possibly this might be where myself and... Uh, your own, uh, disagree somewhat. Uh, there's absolutely a room for altruism. People should be allowed to do with their money what they want to do with it. And if they want to give it to other people, I think that is not just a valid <coughs> use of their money. Um, I think people should be applauded for doing that. I think it's an absolutely uh, laudable thing. But as I say, it's, you cannot base a society around it. Um, it's sometimes claimed that communism um, is, is based around altruism. It's not, they weren't quite, it isn't places where it's still uh, practiced. I mean, people were paid for doing their jobs under communism. The problem with communism wasn't that they didn't have any incentive at all, it's that they didn't have sufficient incentives, because the profit motive didn't exist. And so people were basically incentivized at a pretty low and consistent level across the piece, um, and in fact had an incentive really to, to do more than their neighbor did. So I am neither for or against altruism, um, I, I don't think it's a suitable system of governance, and although it's a nice thing to do, you're never going to get very far with it if, if you depend upon it. Um, but in the title of the question, or the, the title of the debate uh, posed today, things like healthcare and welfare and um, uh, foreign affairs, and these, I don't think anyone is seriously suggesting we have a health system based on altruism nor a welfare system based on altruism. People can make the case that some foreign wars are started on an altruistic basis. Um, 
and I think we'll probably get into that as the uh, as the evening wears on. But for me, issues like healthcare and welfare, you, they have, the system to be judged not on how altruistic they are, but simply how efficient they are. I'm not going to discount a priori the possibility that there is more for government in healthcare and welfare. So, so let me just let me just sharpen maybe the difference, but I don't I don't think the difference is really there, or it's or it's not a, a big difference. Um, so I think altruism is evil. I don't think you should have any altruism. Mm -hmm. But let's let's be clear what we mean by altruism. Yeah. Altruism is not about being nice to people. It's not even about being charitable to people. It's not even about giving your money away to people. That's none of that is altruism. Altruism is about living your life for the sake of other people. Make other people the primary value, the primary <clears throat> purpose of your life. That is always evil, always wrong, always out. I have nothing against charity, nothing against helping people, certainly not people who deserve help. Uh, <clears throat> nothing against being kind and nice and opening doors to old ladies or whatever, right? <laughs> Although I'm not sure we're supposed to say that. Two gender, two sexes, yeah. Um, old people, old uh, uh, gender neutral people. Um, <laughs> so, I, 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 yeah, there you go. I think one, I think one of the one of the problems in our intellectual world today is that we've taken this term that is clearly used in a particular way in, in, in terms of denouncing self-interest, denouncing uh, the profit motive, and denouncing your right to live for the sake of your own happiness and using it as kindness or using it as being nice when kindness, being nice and being charitable are all completely consistent with living your life for yourself, your own self-interest consistent with the profit motive uh, indeed the best way to change the world and to make the world a better place is through the profit motive I, I think we'll probably uh, agree on that so I, I, to me in terms of important concepts Important. And altruism as a concept means something and it's used in a very, very uh, kind of perverse way. I do want to say one thing about Adam Smith, because I, I agree completely um, that one of the problems that we live in is that Adam Smith said, look, the baker bakes for his own sake. He doesn't bake it for his customer. I mean, customers are there because he needs to make a living, right? So self-interest drives the capitalist economy. The capitalist economy is driven by self-interest. And everybody knows that. But what Adam Smith said kind of, right? He said, yeah, and self-interest is not this really thing. We, we're, not, we're not excited about self-interest, right? It's not virtuous. It's not noble. So you've got a bunch of people doing these things that are not so nice, you know, almost a vice. But it turns out when you add all these vices up, it turns into a good thing because society as a whole is better off. And nobody buys it. Nobody buys this idea that self-interest somehow, when it additive, it turns into something good. And I think that's part of what we fight when, we, when we're trying to advocate for freedom and capitalism, is this idea that people resent self-interest. And this is, I think, Rand's contribution to this debate. Rand says, no, 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 you got to say, yeah. Self-interest is what virtue is. Self-interest is noble. When it's rational, long-term self-interest, that is what morality should be about. Morality should be about figuring out what's, how to live the best life you live discovering principles that help guide your life. And then, of course, when people out there doing this virtuous stuff, then the sum of all those virtues is a better world, just like Adam Smith describes it. It's not adding up vices, it's adding up virtues. When the baker is concerned about feeding his family, that's what he should be concerned about. That's what virtue constitutes, is taking care of yourself and the people you love. Uh, so, I, I don't think we can ever win the battle for freedom and capitalism unless we win the battle against altruism and for a moral conception of self-interest. And that, I think, is where the rubber hits the road. That's where the real interesting stuff is. It's in ethics. Because I think once, once, people, once people accept, although we're far from that, once people accept the idea of the ability of a rational self-interest, then of course they want to be free because the only way to pursue your own happiness and the only way to pursue your own long-term interest is to be left free to go out there and, and you know, go out, be, you know, try different things uh, uh, and, and fail, succeed, but 
live your life based on your own standards and not based on other people's standards. It's altruism that makes socialism, statism, and, and all the statism junk and mumbo jumbo that's out there palatable. Is this idea that I shouldn't take care of myself? That's not my <clears throat> moral narrative. Other people should take care of me. It's their responsibility. It's actually their job. It's actually their moral duty to take care of me. No, it's not. Did I jump in? So, <laughs> We've got a moderate call. So the, the, those who call themselves effective altruists aren't really altruists. They're act utilitarians. So there's, there's, there's a difference. I think. Um, you, you, I'm sure you'll think that act utilitarianism is also evil, right? But at least an act utilitarian says not deny self-interest at all, but that you should give your own interest exactly the same way as everyone else's interests in the world and maximize the sum total of people's interest impartially. That seems like a theoretically more robust foundation than a morality that says your interests don't count at all. All, all that you should care about are other interests. How about the view that? As Bentham said, everyone counts for one and no one for more than one. What's wrong with that? Well, so so I, much better than altruism, I agree. And effective altruism is an attempt of uh, this, this utilitarian facade to, to altruism. Uh, I still think it's wrong, and I think it's, you know, uh, in, in my terminology, evil. And we all like this, whether we admit it or not, right? And I always do this test to a group of, of people who claim to be altruists, right? I ask them. Okay, your kids are drowning in the swimming pool, and the neighbor's kids are drowning in the swimming pool. Whose kids do you save first? And everybody saves them more than my neighbor's kids. I don't buy the Christian idea, love thy neighbor like yourself. I don't. Nobody does. Nobody should. You don't know your neighbor like yourself. You're never going to get as much pleasure from your neighbor as you can provide yourself. You're never going to get... A, you, they can do happy. <laughs> <laughs> And your happiness should be what's important to you. So politically, we should all be treated the same, right? So the one, the one area which I'm an advocate of equality is political equality, and equality of rights and equality of freedom. But morally, the unit, the agent, is the individual, and morality is there to guide the individual to achieve his eudaimonia in Aristotle's terms, his, his own individual flourishing. And to the extent that other people's well-being is beneficial to yours, which I think it is, then to that extent you love them or you don't. And so, so I'm not against charity if it's charity that is consistent with your personal values. But I'm against kind of the blind charity of just giving to whoever or, as effective altruism, looking for the people as remote as possible, as far away from you as possible, so that you diffuse any claim of self-interest, even though they think it's good for them, right? So you look for the people in Africa. You don't help people in your neighborhood. You look for people in Africa as far away from you as possible to help them. That, that idea I reject. You know, if, if I'm going to help people, I'm going to help people close to me. I still don't see how it's actually evil. I mean, I can understand why you would care more about yourself than other people. I can understand why you care more about your children than other children. And I know I even care more about the people in this room than the people on the other side mm -hmm. uh, of the planet. You care about the people in your own country than the people in another country, arguably. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's a... Um, I think it's a kind of false dichotomy to say that either you... Because you don't care about other people as much as you care about themselves, that you essentially shouldn't care about them at all, and that he's actually evil to care about them. That's the bit so I, I, I never said that. I don't argue that you shouldn't care about them at or all. Or give them money. Although, them out. although at the end of the day, the they are always for me to let. Do, you know, so you could ask me, do you care about the fact that people are dying of salvation right now in Africa? And my answer is yes. I mean, they're human beings. They care about life. It's, it's kind of sad that they're dying. Am I willing to do anything about it? And the answer is no. I, I'm not willing to. I don't write a check and send it to Africa. Um, I've got limited resources. I've got limited time. I've got a limited life. And my focus is on making my life the best that it can be on this planet. And I don't think helping people in Africa right now is the best use of my life. Um, the standard, the, the, the issue is what is the standard? For me, the standard is my life. Right? What is good for me? And it, that doesn't mean I don't care. It just means it's all within the context of the you, what, what effective 
altruism or what it, 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 utilitarianism in all its forms wants to do is to change that standard. And that's what I view as evil. It takes the standard away from my life and it creates some kind of utility <coughs> function across this room or across this nation or across this planet. Uh, and then it places your interest somehow, you know, the interest of the group here somehow above my interest because I do need to sacrifice what I believe is good for me for their sake. It's that shifting of standards which I view as, as the, the essential evil. It's moving away from what's good for me. But what, you, what you, if I understand you correctly, the really objective is the government taking our money and giving it to other people. You don't object to other people giving their money to Africans who are starving. You personally don't want to do it. It's, 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 a, it's a, what you see as a theft. Well, no, I object to more than just that. So, um, so, so let's take two crap. Politically, you can do whatever you want with your money, right? You can burn it, you can give it to anybody, you, you can commit suicide, you can do whatever you want with your life. Do you think they're making a mistake? But immorally, <coughs> I morally, I think they're making a mistake. Because morally, I don't think we're taught, and I don't think they do it, to, to really consider what's in our own self-interest. I don't think we're taught to contemplate that, to consider that. You know, Aristotle viewed that as a science, right? The science of morality is, is to figure out what is good for you, what virtues you should pursue, what actions you should pursue in order to make your life the best life they can be. I don't think we teach that. So I think a lot of people, a lot of people with money, find themselves in a situation with money, and politically, sure, they can, I don't, I'm not going to stop them. I'm not going to use coercion to stop them from giving their money away. But I would like, I think the world would be a better place. I think we'd be much more likely on the road towards capitalism, a pure form of capitalism, real free markets. If people actually considered, instead of guilt implied by how they were raised, actually considered what is truly my, what's the best thing I can do with this money to make my life the best life that it can be. And maybe it turns out that Bill Gates gives it to Africa. I doubt it. I mean, I've been to Seattle, a lot of homeless kids under the bridges. There's a lot of stuff you could do locally. But the whole point of Bill Gates giving it to Africa is to show the world, look, there's nothing in it. There's no self-interest in it. And that's sad to me. It's sad that he had to exert effort to show that he is moral when I think that... And it's because he thinks the most efficient use of his money in reducing misery and saving lives is everything we're actually dying on. No. no, no, absolutely not. And, and indeed, I think he's done more to help people to prevent death in Africa by creating Microsoft than he ever will do with his funding. Yeah. I mean, think about, think about the improved logistics to get food to Africa because of, of use of PCs. Yeah, and again, that's a false, it's not a false dichotomy. I mean, he can do both. He's already done with Microsoft. He yeah. now, now uses vast fortune, which is, I mean, the, the, the marginal gains from another million pounds, a million bucks to him, is essentially zero. But the gain, I don't want to get too utilitarian now, but the gains to some starting Africa clearly is way more zero. I, I, basically, I'm not sure it's even, it's anywhere close to zero. I think the marginal gains is huge because I don't think the, the marginal gain to, to to somebody like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, is measured by money. So I think it's by success. It's by achieving something. I think if you watch Bill Gates being interviewed, uh, as I have a few times, uh, when he talks about his investments in startups, because he does that, he invests in companies, he invested heavily in this in, uh, fourth generation nuclear technology, he tried to build a plant now in China. He gets excited. His eyes, you know, shine. He gets, you know, you can tell this guy loves technology. He loves investing. And he'll change the world doing this, like really change the world, really improve the lives of people. When he talks about philanthropy, he's excited, but it's like, eh, it's not that important to him. The real stuff, you can tell that if he took away the guilt, if he took away other people's expectations of what he should do, not, I don't even know if he feels guilt, I know he thinks he should feel guilt. If he took that away, I think Bill Gates would be, would, would, would spend, first of all, he would have never left Microsoft. And second, I think he'd be spending his time investing in <coughs> high tech companies growing companies, not because he needs another billion dollars, but because of the fun of creating new technologies and seeing a flourish around the world and really changing the world, really making it a better place through technological change, which is the way you really bring people out of poverty, not by, by you know, investing in, what, uh, malaria nets. I mean, great, I have nothing against that. And if that's what he ultimately chose to do, I would say I have no problem with it. I just don't think he's going through the right method methodology making that choice. I think he's being influenced too much by other people and by a wrong moral code. What would you do if you had his money? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'd probably be, you know, I'd probably find something I would love doing in his, you know, if I loved investing, I would probably invest it primarily. But you 
Right. And, and, and then I would, what I would do actually, is I would invest heavily, um, I would invest heavily in what I think really changes the world, and that is ideas. I would go to Africa, but I wouldn't go to Africa with malaria ads. I would go to Africa with, with copies of Atlas Shrugged and, and, <laughs> and, and, and to some extent, you know, the wealth of nations, right? So I would go to Mises and, and, and Ayn Rand uh, to, to, uh, to Africa because I think that's how you cure poverty. You cure poverty adopting capitalism. I think that's every way it's tried. It works. So uh, I, 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 wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I think what he's doing is marginal at best. I think you can do, I mean, look what's happening in Rwanda right now in Africa. Uh, in Rwanda, the, the president of Rwanda, for whatever reasons, maybe it's random, accidental, whatever, you know, interviewed some people about what they think he should do, and, and they said property rights and, and free markets, and he's adopted it. And, and Rwanda's, the, I think, the fastest growing, or one of the fastest growing economies in the world right now. In Rwanda, in like this little country in Central Africa, is he helping the poor more than anything Bill Gates is doing? Absolutely. Absolutely, in long term, that'll change Africa. They're now talking about a free, a free trade zone, like throughout Africa, where there are no tariffs throughout Africa. Stuff like that will improve the fate of poor people a million times more than anything Bill Gates does. That's a question about lack of duty to be at all altruistic. So, so here's a scenario: you, you, you like to climb peaks in yep. this country, mm -hmm. and this is the one you want to climb. You're headed up the mountain. You're nearly at the top, and you see this couple. One of the people in the couple drops down, has a heart attack. You've got a cell phone. They don't. Should you phone uh, 999 in this country um, and console the spouse of the person yeah. who's got the heart attack, or should you? You won't be able to meet your goal of getting the number. Sure, sure. And I think most people hear you up to do that. I mean, would you say it's only if I have this feeling of sympathy that I should do that? But if not, if I really think that I just really want to, you know, yeah, achieve my goal of climbing the mountain, then it, 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 it would be. So you've made it easy, right? Because Peter Singer uses a similar example. He makes it a little harder. Oh, yeah. We can take on Peter Simmons with the river and the child doing it. We can, we, can, we can use Peter Singer's example to make it even tougher. But look, two points on me. First, one doesn't. One doesn't define morality based on emergency situations. That is a the, the whole trolley, the whole trolley examples, it's false examples. This is this is not life. Life is about what you do every single day with your mind and with your life and with your money and with your choices. I think it's sad to me that philosophy has deteriorated so much that all we talk about is these emergency situations, which none of us actually know. This is actually a real but, situation. No, no, I know it's a real situation for somebody, like, so, so it's a but from moments in which that's happening every single day. So, for example, every single day a child is dying in Africa, and I could pick up my cell phone and wire them money and save their life. Every single day I choose not to do it, and all of us do. Yeah, uh, almost yeah, of us do. Right? It says so, it makes no difference whether it's sending money or this... And he's right. Situation. And I, well, maybe, 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 it's not maybe if you're the only person you can so, save them. So there's no question in my mind that everybody with, with, with any kind of sense of themselves, any kind of sense of the world, would stop and help the person there. There's no doubt about that, right? Life is precious. Life is a value. Somebody else's life is a value to me. You know, not knowing who they are, they're a really nasty, horrible human being, I probably keep walking. But you know, not knowing who they are, Every human life is a potential, some good, a potential value, and I, I value life. Hey, I take care of my pets. I, if, 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 if I, I take care of plants, I value life. Life is a beautiful thing. Other people's life is a beautiful thing to me. So it is a value to me, therefore, yes. But take Peter Singer's example. Peter Singer's example says like this, right? You've got a child, you're walking to work, and you're in a nice suit, and you're nice, uh, you know, nice shoes and everything. And in the shallow water, so you're not risking your life, there's a child drowning, and you have to get into the river, ruin your suit, ruin your suit, so it's 300 bucks, 400 bucks, something like that. You, it's not a very good suit, right? <laughs> um, and so you've ruined your suit, you, you're getting the child and bringing him out. Would you do it? And you go, well, of course you do. I mean, it's, it's a child dying, and it's just 300 bucks. Of course you would save the child. All right, what happens if it happens the next day? And the next day? And I'd say I would take a different route to work. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. If, if, if every time I walk, it's a I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, my life is not, I am not 
as in a sense enslaved to ch children dying, children you know drowning. And I'm not going to put myself in a position where I have to save every child that's drowning. And that's why I don't send money to Africa because that's not the purpose of my life. Is to, now if I had the kind of money Bill Gates. I would think strategically about what is the best way to, to, to make an impact on the world. I think the two ways are one through technological investment and the second is to spread ideas that really make a difference. And I would make sure that I was having fun doing it because I, 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 I need to get a value from it. So that so, was how I treat that. So Judith Thompson, the, the one who wrote the article about the, the, the cloud climate. English, yeah. and she says we, we, we don't have to be good Samaritans. So you don't have to go on that every day. We have to be at least minimally decent Samaritans. So at least the, the, But that's not that's, that's not altruism. This is again the perversion of concepts, which I think I think hurts us because I think it's important when you talk about morality, when you talk philosophically, that we clarify exactly what we're talking about. That's being a good Samaritan. That's being a good person. It's 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 being nice to one's own man. Altruism means something different. Altruism is a much more all encompassing philosophical approach. To morality, and when we when we dilute our concepts, I think we all lose. Peter Singer is an altruist. Yeah, Peter yeah. Singer wants you wants you to save that kid every single day. Wants you to send, I mean, to begin with ten percent of your money to Africa, but ultimately a lot more than that because it's always the marginal dollar. It's always is the suit. Is the kid's life more important than a suit? Yes. So you have to send three hundred dollars. Is he more important than your car? Yes. So now you have to send ten thousand dollars. And it's always going to increase. I'm not. I, I, I reject that philosophy. So he's all and you're nothing. And the truth is somewhere in between. No, the truth is with me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I jump in there and ask? Um, we had some questions back there. So. Yeah. Okay, so and, and I don't want to dominate. Chris is. <laughs> so how can we adopt capitalism if people are dying of malaria? So if, if Bill Gates is saving lives, and obviously you need to live for capitalism, then is he not, in the long run, um, saving more lives by sending these nets? Is that not in his own self-interest to make more Microsoft computers or, you know, invest heavily? Well, again, I think you're conflating, and, and I think this is this is what's always done. You're <coughs> conflating self-interest with monetary gain, and self-interest is not equal to monetary gain. Uh, self-interest is equal to self-interest, which is what is truly in your self-interest, which includes material well-being and includes spiritual well-being. And there's a lot, the spiritual well-being is big, it's not, and this is why I don't think Bill Gates gets his kicks out of making another billion dollars, I think he gets his kicks out of achieving another goal, having, having a, a goal, whether it's a material goal or non-material goal, it's, it's the goal that's important to, to these guys. It's why billionaires work harder than most average people, even after they're multi-billionaires, because it's not about the extra billion, it's about the fun of making the extra billion, it's about achieving the extra billion, not what you're going to use the extra billion for. I, I don't think you have to cure malaria in order to establish capitalism. I think what happens when you establish capitalism is surprise, surprise, malaria is cured, right? So uh, I come from a country that used to be very malaria prone in the early part of the 20th century. And what made malaria go away were not nets, what made malaria go away was drying swamps, building cities, building civilization. Civilization made malaria go away. Um, and, 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 and that's the precursor to getting rid of, I, I, I'm originally from Israel, for, for those for full disclosure. Israel in the early days, they got rid of the malaria, was, they got rid of the swamp. Today you're not allowed to do that because it's called wetlands, and you're not allowed to eliminate swamps. But we used to call them swamps, and the ugly, horrible places where ugly, bad mosquitoes used to live. And by buying them out and bringing a killer to the streets from Australia and places, things like that. They got rid of, of the malaria problem in Israel. So, and of course, the, the vaccine is not vaccine. What, what's the treatment for malaria? There's a treatment for malaria. You can take pills. Like I, when I travel to these places, they give you pills to take. That's a product of capitalism. So all of that, the way to solve disease problems like that is to bring realization, which involves bringing capitalism. We jump over to Chris actually very quickly because he's so decided during this interview. Oh, I see. <laughs> and Dr. Ring, I was no, no, don't come back on any of that at all. Well, I still, I'm still not convinced that the two things are incompatible. I don't see why Bill Gates can't spread tourism and spread technology and these <coughs> wonderful things, and also give his like, surplus money to good causes. And possibly that that money would be best spent handing out translations of the stroke. Possibly it'd be. Better off with um, Perinex. I think that's something you could probably test empirically. 
Uh, perhaps. I mean, we both run our institutes are funded by donors, right? Absolutely. Are these, are these Oh, no, as I said, I am fine. What, what kind of person would donate to the uh, Rand Institute? I haven't read the books. So I have the very difficult task of going to people and, and trying to convince them that it's in their rational self-interest to donate their money to the Rand Institute. And if I was convinced that it was that Bill Gates had gone through the process of figuring out that it was in his rational self-interest to give net. I would be all for that. I have no problem with what you choose to do with your money if you're doing it for the right reason. And I think there can be a right reason to give malaria. So I'm not saying there's no reason ever to give malaria nets. But to get to, to, to I'm not, I, based on how Bill Gates speaks about it, I am convinced he hasn't, doesn't have the right reason. Reasons matter in morality. They don't matter in politics as much. Because politically we can say, it's your money, you can do whatever you want with it. But morally, why you do something matters, not just what you do. So if you do what other people perceive as a good thing, but for the wrong reasons, then it's not a good thing. Okay, so yeah, we're going to rewind back to the children example. So we were children. I forget to about frame, that. Frame, oh. this, frame this question. Let's accept the Randy definition of altruism. Um, What's up, Rand? It's not Rand's yeah, definition. It's Rand. Obviously, Cook's definition. Okay, Rand, Rand <laughs> definition. Yeah. So I think an interesting uh, aspect. Of is that there's no prominent children in the novel. If you look at John Galt's city in Galt, there's no entry of children whatsoever. So it's following all these entrepreneurs and innovative people who make their own way and can pursue their natural self-interest. But surely the parent child relationship is not altruistic. An eight-year-old can't pursue his own self-interest without the help of the parent. So how does the parent get that help in the first place if it's not altruistic? So first of all, it, yeah. unfortunately I don't have my copy of Alice Schrock here. <laughs> to point out to you that there are children in Gold's Gulch. But there are children in Gold's Gulch. And there's a, there's a scene where a mother is kind of, Dagny talks to the mother and the mother explains, you know, whatever. Um, but that's the reality. A book can't have everything that you want to have in it. The book, you know, an author has to make choices about what's in it and what's not. As somebody who's had children, uh, which I suspect some of you have not, uh, <laughs> I don't sacrifice my children. <laughs> I do stuff for my children, but I don't, but my children are really, really important to me. So when I don't go to the movies and stay with my children, that's not a sacrifice. My children are more important to me than going to the movies. I mean, we throw this word out, sacrifice, without defining it, without thinking it through. Sacrifice means giving up a higher value for something of less value or for no value. Otherwise, it's not a sacrifice. Otherwise, I'm just doing what's good for me, right? It's good for me to invest in my children. Now, why is it good for me to invest my children? I mean, there are two aspects of this. One is, your child did not ask to come into this world. You chose to bring them in. By making that choice, you made a commitment. It's an implicit contract that you made to take care of that child to the best of your ability up to a certain age. In my case, 18 and they're out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little beyond that. What's that? I'm sorry. It's arbitrary to draw that line at 18. Why, yeah, I mean, why not at 5? Well, no, no, it's not arbitrary to draw at 18. Your responsibility as a parent is to, is to take care of the child until they can take care of themselves. So when they achieve, whether it's you want it to be 17 or 19, that's somewhat arbitrary, the exact date. But it's until they have the, the mental capacity and the physical capacity to take care of themselves. Once they take, take care of themselves, you no longer have a moral responsibility to take care of them as a parent. You want to take care of them because you love them, but you no longer have the moral responsibility, or actually a legal responsibility. I think, I think as a parent, you have a legal responsibility to take care of your kid up until that age. So you have taken on a legal moral responsibility. It's not true of all parents, but it would be nice if it was true of all parents. You love them. That is, you get great pleasure from taking care of them, even though it's hard. But a lot of things we do in life are hard that we enjoy doing and are hard. And some, you know, sometimes at work, it sucks. You hate your boss. You, you hate your coworkers. But you know what? You love your job, basically. So some days just suck. That doesn't mean it's not in your self-interest to keep on with the job. Because over the long run, the job is good for you, even though in any particular time, it's hard. With kids, and this is why I tell people, don't have kids. Unless, there is an unless, you really thought about it and you really committed to having the kids because it's 10 times harder than you think 
it's, it's the toughest thing you probably will do in life. So make sure you want to do it. Because otherwise you will suffer and the kids will suffer. Nobody big wins if you have kids. But once you have them, you're committed. It's like, I sign a contract to pay my mortgage, and then I just say, no, I don't feel like paying. No, that, the same thing with a kid. Once you have a kid, you're committed whether you like it or not, whether you have to love them a lot. I think some parents don't love their children, which is sad, but they're still committed to kids. <coughs> all right, we got a lot of uh, questions. Chris, do you want to come back on that at all? No? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I, I totally agree with what you were saying about Bill Gates and virtue signaling, whatever else. Yeah. But virtue signaling is effective like an act of narcissism, right? So that I can sit at the dinner party and say to other people, like, I'm more moral than you because I did this and you didn't. Mm -hmm. So he's not doing it for, for being altruistic. He's, he's gaining something for his, for his money. That's the reason uh, that he's doing that. I don't think that's a good thing. I think ultimately it makes the whole debate generate and we're focusing on the wrong things. I agree with you on that. But it's obviously narcissism. I agree with you completely. I don't think that the... the, the the, the alternative in life is to be Mother Teresa or to be your own, right? <laughs> right? It's not to be a complete self, you know, if people don't behave in ways that are either completely self-interested, I think they should, they don't, or to be Mother Teresa. What happens is you get all kinds of variations. And what Bokeh, I think, is, is somebody who basically lives a pretty self-interested life. Because of the way he grew up, and if you read a little bit about his family, his, his father in particular, and his wife, who is very Christian, and if you read about some of the people surrounding him, I think he has felt, he is told he should feel guilty and should do these things. And he does it in order to reduce this supposed guilt that he has. So I don't think he's doing it altruistically. I think he's doing it stupidly. He's doing it to appease other people. He's doing it to appease unowned guilt. Guilt he shouldn't have to be doing. <coughs> so he's done it out, but he's not being self-interested either. He's somewhere so, you know, where, where do you place the virtue signal? That's what I'm getting at. Where do you place this, the, the I idea of the virtue signal? I think virtue signaling is an immoral, uh, <coughs> meaningless, stupid, second-handed act that you shouldn't engage in. You're a moral person. I, I think it's just, it's just so... A couple of honestly simple points. Firstly, uh, Mother Teresa was not a nice person. I <laughs> she was uh, um, as, as a model of altruism. She willingly made hundreds, if not thousands, of people suffer for her, um, her religion. Secondly, virtue signaling, uh, this term is used all the time now. And uh, I think James Barth Bartholomew in The Spectator came up with it a couple of years ago. And it is now used in relation to anything that vaguely involves showing off or anything of that kind. I, the, as James said in that article, the, what differs virtue signaling from other forms of attracting attention to is that there is zero cost involved to it. So he was originally talking about people on Twitter who were expressing their interest or signing petitions or whatever it may be. You know, 10 seconds of being a keyboard warrior. <coughs> Bill Gates, whether or not you agree with his um, charitable actions, and personally I think actually they're pretty good, uh, is not virtue signaling in that sense. He clearly has got skin in the game. He's put a lot of money in. So you, you can accuse him of showing off. You can say that it, you know, the, even though the sums of money are enormous, that they probably don't mean much to him. That's probably true. But he's not actually uh, virtue signaling. And the fact that the amount of money he's spending doesn't mean anything to him. I think it's a very good reason for him to spend it altruistically rather than just to hoard it uh, or even buy millions of copies of the shrubs. I, I really don't see the issue there with people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg who have promised to give away most, if not all, of their fortune um, in their lifetime. I think it's very much actually the acceptable place of colors when people decide to, to do that. Uh, and they, they certainly shouldn't be condemned for it. Okay. And that, that's the big difference between me and the Europe, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do, you think, do you think it's bad <coughs> that Bill Gates feels guilty for his success? Well, does he? I'm not sure he does. He says he? he does. He does, does he? I mean, in a recent interview, he said he said something like, I'm not sure if I should feel guilty for having a big house. Should you feel guilty for, for, for no, that? No, absolutely not. No, no I agree with you. No. So, so I, you know, we, we, the debate about how to use your money and whether you should give it to charity or not, I don't think it's interesting because I agree that if Bill Gates actually figured out that this is the best, again, with being kind and being charitable and doing these things and, and helping people out. There's nothing inconsistent about that with rational self-interest. 
if it's done right. And I think of all the people who've ever done charity, let me be on Sorry, record. So, but you, it's not inconsistent with Russell Southern just why? Because he gets such a glow of self-satisfaction from doing it. No, because, how it, how it, how because, it because again, because I think when life is a value to oneself. If one values one's own life. One values life. One values living beings. And to see suffering is unpleasant. It's it's, it's just, it, not just unpleasant in the sense of I, I don't want to look, but to, to know that people are suffering, it's just, you know the potential that human beings have. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual value in, in seeing people flourish and being, seeing people successful. And they put help them. To do something about that is not self-interest. It is opposite. No, I think it is self-interest. I think it's absolutely self-interest. No, because as you said, the money Bill Gates is giving is, is insignificant. It doesn't, it's not a sacrifice. It's not Why a sacrifice. is it sacrifice? <coughs> it's still billions and billions he's, of dollars. He's giving billions of dollars to get something in return, and he gets something in return. He gets the satisfaction of knowing that he's helping right, so life. Right, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so yeah, in a sense it's satisfaction. But that, that yeah. kind of, it, it, it but, reduces the definition of, or it broadens the definition of self-interest so wide that it can encompass almost anything. In that no, if because... You say, if you say that, oh, well, yeah, he's, he's sacrificed this and this, but he feels good it's, in doing it. It's kind of a, it's almost a tautological this definition is, of, of utility, yes. right? No, you absolutely... There's nothing you, can, you, you, can, you can't do which won't be self-interest. Yes, yeah, so and this is why I try to, I, I, I keep trying to, to make a caveat about it, right? So, if you actually think it through and decide that these are the things that are good for you, then really, so that the reason you feel good about it is not because you have some unowned guilt or because it's some random emotion. But you really, you really decided based on your hierarchy of value that helping these people in Africa is really consistent with it. Then it's not. Then it's consistent with your, your self-interest. To the extent that you're doing it to appease some guilt, which I think Bill Gates is doing to some extent. To the extent you're doing it because it just you don't even know why it makes you feel. It just makes you feel good in the moment. That to me is self-interest. Self-interest has to be justifiable, rational. Not to me, why, to why, self. Why is it assuaging your guilt and self-interest? Because, it's, because the, well, for short run, because the, it's unearned guilt. It's unearned guilt, and therefore the real self-interested thing to do is to get rid of the guilt. Why do you have it? Wouldn't the solution be to get rid of the guilt so you don't have to live based on some guilt that you don't have an earned? Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is what, I mean, to me, Rand is not, it, it's not some superficial idea about self-interest. This is a deep idea about what it means to live a good life. And I, I, I think it's it's much more how people think about Aristotle. How do you live a good life? And what he's saying is, she's not against charity, but she's saying is before you give charity, think about whether this is the best use of the, this money for you. And if you find that rationally, that this is the best money, then fine, then charity is right. But I don't think people go through that process. And therefore, again, that process that defines whether it's going to be a good thing or bad. Okay, uh, on the front here, I have one. Hi, uh, Dr. Rick. I already told him I'm a very big fan, and thank you both for this. this. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on determinism. Uh, you know, George Wilson speaks a lot about like, the Pareto principle 20% of people do 80% of all the work. And you can see that some people are just born smarter, or they're born more winners, more effective than I am. You know, um, so people, do you, when you say practitioner theft, you're assuming that it's completely earned by the hard work or whatever, but some people are just born smarter. Bill Gates, I'm sure, is born a lot smarter than anyone in this room. So do you think it's fair to say that it's theft if they didn't, they had, they had a massive unfair advantage when they, when they started? I'm not sure why it's unfair. It is what it is. I mean, this is, you know, my book, Equal is Unfair, is, is, is I talk a lot about this. You're born the way you're born. That's not an issue of fairness or unfairness. If, if a tornado, okay, not a tornado. If a hurricane hits my home right now, destroys my, my, uh, my building and all my valuables and destroy, you know, my wife's there, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> really, something bad that happens. Is that unfair? No, I mean, fairness has nothing to do with it. It's metaphysical. It happened, right? It, it, it's not nice. It's not good. I'm not happy. You know, I'm really sad about it. But fairness is about human choices. Do you think we you don't apply the you don't apply the idea of fairness to what genes you were born with, because nobody had control over that. You can only apply morality. Moral terms only apply to things that are chosen. So look, some people are born smarter than others. Some people are born more athletic than others. I, you know, I use the example of LeBron James a lot. Yeah. LeBron James was born more. Now he worked hard to do. Was just 
Just that he was born. But he, but you know, Jews don't have those genes. We just don't have them to play basketball like that, right? That's just reality. It's not not fair that I can't play basketball like LeBron James. It is. That's reality. Now the fact is that every single dime that LeBron James gets for playing basketball, whether it's you know marketing or whether it's people paying to watch him, he deserves because he no value in basketball. Actually, negative value. No people would pay not to watch me, you know, <laughs> play basketball but because it's such a negative value. So that's just reality. So it, it, why is it fair for me to take some of LeBron James's money? which he created, right? He created with his superior genes and give it to me with my inferior genes. <coughs> Where's that? That's just wrong to do that. But his wealth wasn't created by choice. Sure. Some of that wealth wasn't created by choice. But of course, everything is created by choice because at the end of the day, you have to apply those genes. Your genes don't automatically drive you. You have to drive. I know a lot of people born... Not a lot. I know a few people born with the bronze genetic makeup who are nothings. They made different choices than the bronze. Chris. I know people with IQ of really high IQs that have done nothing because they made different choices than other people with high IQs. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd certainly agree that it's not an issue with fairness the way you're born. It makes no sense to try and apply, like you say, moral reasoning to it. Um, I think the, the practical question is what we do in a society in which, because of various things beyond people's control, their dream, genes, their upbringing, where they're born, the rest of it, um, what we do to make sure there is a lower threshold below which people can't sink. And I think that is a more interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I don't think altruism is the answer to it. Um, and I'm not sure that free markets provide the full answer to it either. I'm thinking here particularly about welfare and healthcare, because so on the bill tonight. Um, very briefly, and again, these are not issues I particularly focus on in my, my own research. Um, it seems to me that although people outside the argument will give you examples from the past of friendly societies and uh, actually quite much more more successful systems of healthcare and welfare than the left would ever give you give them credit for today, when they just act as if everything before 1948 was just a hellish um, free for all. Uh, it nevertheless was was suboptimal. Now the current system we have is clearly suboptimal. Spending over 100 billion pounds a year to relieve poverty, you have done for God knows how long, and yet poverty still clearly persists. The NHS is an absolute disgrace, really, as a as a um, national healthcare system and people's attachment to it in this country only speaks to how parochial people are in this country really and how naive they are about how systems work, work elsewhere. Having said that, um, I think the problem with the insurance model with both welfare and healthcare is, and this is certainly more true in the past but it remains true today, is that some people simply won't afford it and some people have particularly bad luck. And there are, of course, things you can do to avoid bad luck. There are lots of things you can do to avoid being unemployed. There are certain things you can do to uh, avoid um, falling into ill health. But all of these things are literally just random chance. If you have a child born with some you know, terrible um, defect and they're going to recover from that, that is not your fault. There's nothing you could have done about it. Um, if you get leukemia and so on and so on, so on, cancer, all kinds of things. There's lots of random elements to this. So the question is, the, the, the way to deal with that is to have insurance, basically. However, some people can't afford insurance, and so what do we do about that? Well, obviously we could just say, well, that's just the way it is, life isn't fair. Or we can have some kind of um, national insurance system, which is what we theoretically have in this country, but naturally it's a Ponzi scheme, but the, the principle behind it is, I don't think, unsound. I don't think it's something that should persist for a very long time. I consider it to be a sticking plaster over this period of early capitalism that we're currently in until we get to the point in which everyone can afford insurance. But given, in the case of healthcare, given how healthcare costs tend to rise way above the GDP and inflation, uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the inherent of the NHS, this happens all, around, all the way around the world, uh, I think 
that for the fiscal future, there will always be people who won't be able to afford health insurance. And you can call it cynicism or you can call it altruism, but I think there is a case for the government uh, underwriting that. I just don't think we should have the health system that we have in this country because there is no reason whatsoever for the government to actually be providing health care. That's the problem with a lot of nationalisations in this country, including with education. It, it makes sense for the government to provide a, um, a safety net for those who can't afford it. It makes no sense whatsoever <coughs> for one massive government bureaucracy to attempt, very unsuccessfully most of the time, to actually provide services. So, I, I mean, I just say this is, this is an area you will disagree. Um, I'm a purist. So, uh, uh, I don't believe the government should provide, I, I don't think coercion should ever be used um, on anybody uh, in order to achieve some kind of social goal or in order to achieve, uh, in this case, to, to help people who maybe can't afford health insurance or can't afford, can't afford food. Uh, I do believe in a safety net, though, and, and here, I, here we'll hop back to our discussion before. I do believe in a voluntary safety net, in, in, a, in a charitable safety net. Now, I happen to think health care costs move a little differently. I, I don't think it's inevitable that they rise. Um, I think there are plenty of examples where they don't rise. I don't think insurance should be and is, in most cases, so expensive that people can't afford it. But there's always going to be some people who can't afford it. I, I accept that completely. There's already some people who whether for their own fault or not, can't afford health insurance, can't afford to live, can't afford to survive. And I think they depend on other people, right? Other people have to fund them. And the question is, do we force other people to fund them or do we rely on people voluntarily helping them? And I, you know, I think we have to rely on the voluntary help because I think that once you accept force, once you accept coercion, you've got the NHS. I mean, no matter how you structure it, you end up with the NHS. Um, in America, we're heading towards NHS, even though we had a very different system. And we're heading towards that primarily because once you accept the government's role in these kind of things, it's, you've accepted coercion. The slippery slopes do actually exist in the world, and they do actually work in the world. Now, let me just, one caveat. In the transition between the world we live in today, and the world I'd like us to live in, but I don't think we will anytime soon, um, <clears throat> solutions like this are inevitable, right? We're, we're going to have to have transitions. And uh, I'm, for example, the way to solve the problem with education today in America, and I assume here, for the, if, it's for the government to fund it, but not to run it, right? So uh, education saving accounts, they call them in the U.S., so you get a check, you can send your kids to any school you want, the government is funding that education. The same thing with health care. If you can't afford health care, the thing to get is a voucher where you can use it to buy insurance rather than the government providing you insurance. I'd like to see you still participating in the market to buy insurance, but with the government funding it if you can't afford to fund it. And the same with a lot of these things. I think there are ways to do it more efficiently as we transition to the day where those vouchers are actually zero because nobody needs them or because we built a, a voluntary safety net. You've been waiting a while, so. Yes, yeah. Um, well, thank you for coming here today. Um, so, um, actually, I've always been uh, very convinced with capitalism as a solution for more and more wealth and poverty. But um, I've been thinking about how capitalism works. So, capitalism puts, so without taxation, without anything, capitalism puts uh, people who are obsessed with um, work at the Top, they have most of the money, um, and um, people who are not like that are at the bottom of, like, near zero. Is it, is it good that we are turning this way of life to enslave yourself to something you may not like? I mean, some people don't like working in banks, but they do it just to uh, in high income. So maybe, maybe someone would like to play music instead, but they can't because they're too poor. Um, how would you rationalize all that? Like, is it the best? Is the is it is the answer to just do? So I don't get the whole thing of the question. All capitalism is is a system that leads you free to make those decisions for yourself. So my kids, I I brought my kids, you know, maybe falsely to to believe that what they should do in life is pursue their passion, to do something they <coughs> love doing. 
So they're both starving artists. <laughs> and they chose to be starving artists. And while I need to help them, I'm not going to help them so that they're not starving artists. This is the life they chose, and this is what they're going to do. And they're going to, they're going to suffer or be joy <laughs> through it. And they, you know, they love it. They, they're, they're having a blast. They, they're poor. <clears throat> I want one of the way they live. But they, they're pursuing what they really believe and what they value and what they enjoy. And I provide them with the safety net, right? Voluntarily. Um, but, it, you know, they could have gone to work in a bank, and it, they're both smart, and they, and they work hard, right? And so you, you position it as people who work hard make a lot of money. You know, I know a lot of people who work really hard who never make a lot of money, either because the work that they do is not that value-added or because they do work in areas that is value-added but only very few people know it's value added. So very, only very few people buy, like artists. Artists is very hard to make a living uh, because you might create something, you might be a genius, but very few people know you're a genius. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's, not, it's not a correlation between hard work and, and wealth. Um, but the beauty of capitalism is you get to make those choices. You can go work for a bank, make a little bit of money, then do your art. You can do your art and then go work for the bank. You can try different professions. You can move around. You decide how obsessed you want to be with money. You don't, there's no, capitalism doesn't say, there's no commandment in capitalism, thou shall do everything in your power to make as much money as possible. No. You, you want to make a lot of money? Make, and you can, then you do it. You don't want to make a lot of money like a lot of us, right? We chose to work in a nonprofit sector. <laughs> well, I chose to be not exactly a lucrative profession. I've got a PhD in finance. I could have gone to Wall Street. I, I literally gave up millions of dollars to do this. <laughs> That's real reality. I mean, and I don't regret I mean, it, right? I mean, this is a lot more fun than sitting at a bank making a lot of money. So capitalism gives you those opportunities to make those choices about your life. It's not the system that dictates a way of life. That's the big difference between it and socialism and, and other status systems, is that it just leaves you free. Chris? Well, yeah, I mean, you get the opportunity to maximize your utility, yeah. you know, and it's, it's a horrible phrase, really. And it's just such a shame that the word utility over time comes to be almost the exact opposite of what Bentham wants it to be. But utility is happiness, really. And you can measure happiness with money, and economists do it all the time. They try and put a, a monetary value on happiness. Um, and obviously, you can put a money value on money. And if somebody is in a bank earning a lot of money but not being particularly happy, you can still add up their total utility. If somebody is in a band being very happy with their job earning very little money, you can work that out. And it's quite possible the two will more or less balance out. We'll trade off happiness for money and vice versa. The important thing, Gavin says, is that they have the opportunity to do that. And broadly speaking, um, they do. And yes, we can't create a world in which bankers. Uh, necessarily as happy as a, as a musician when he's on stage, uh, and vice versa. But, you know, we were talking about unfairness before, this is, uh, the, Thomas Sowell talks about cosmic justice, you know, that's what he describes um, social justice as, and that's sometimes what it is, it's kind of a sort of utopian um, vision in which everybody is happy in every aspect of their life, without ever having to make any trade-offs or ever having to do any effort. And there's a reason that because they've paid a lot of money, it's because often the job's quite dull, you have to spend years perhaps to do it, you have to do very long hours, and there's a reason there's a massive oversupply of poets and musicians, it's because everyone wants to do it, and it's good fun. Uh, although banking can be fun. So, I mean, I know bankers who love what they do, and it's a challenge, and it's, it's just like, it's like being good at an engineer. I mean, some people have a blast doing it. And, and ideally, find something where you make money and have fun doing it. That's the idea. Yeah. A lot of hands. Uh, at the back. Hi, uh, can you connect a policy of self interest to a rational foreign policy? Could this is a lie to me? Perhaps maybe with reference to your country of origin and Israel's uh, maybe a political How long do you have? Um, <laughs> I mean, yes, I, I absolutely. Uh, rational self interest. Look, it, it goes to what is the purpose of government for rational self interested individuals, right? So as ra rational self-interested individuals want government to do the one thing government, I think, is instituted to do, which is protect our freedoms. It's, it, government is force. Government is a gun. Government is coercion. The only place that a gun that force has in our world is 
to, to provide self-defense. It's to provide us against the real bad guys who would use force and, 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 and guns against us. To me, the only role of government is the protection of individual rights, which, you know, now Bentham said rights are what nonsense on stilts. I don't think they are. I think they're real. They're basically freedoms, right? Rights are freedoms. They're the freedom to act. I want the government to protect my freedom to act and leave me alone otherwise. Now, what, how does that relate to foreign policy? What that means is the job of the government is to protect individual rights vis-a-vis -vis people, foreigners, who would come into the country and help me. Terrorists, invaders, or whatever. And that's it. So it's there to protect me from bad actors who want to hurt the citizens, me, the citizens. And it's in my self interest to delegate that responsibility to the government and to pay something to the government to do it. Because when the Nazis come, just me fighting by myself, I, you know, is... is useless. We need an institution that can actually protect our lives from the bad guys. Uh, when it comes to Israel, the first thing you have to do is define who are the bad guys and the good guys. I, I think it's clear uh, based on who, you know, I, I look at countries and to define who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, I look at do they basically protect individual rights or don't they? Countries that basically protect individual rights are the good guys. Countries that Governments that don't protect the individual rights of their citizens are bad guys. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that's fairly easy. Israel, with all its flaws, and I'm a huge critic of every government that Israel's ever had, basically is a rights-respecting uh, government that protects the rights. You can be, you, you, you can own property, you can be gay, you can say whatever you want for the most part. It has about as many rights protecting policies than almost any other Western country in the world, and it's basically a good country. Uh, the Palestinians are the opposite. They don't. They never have. They don't respect their own people's rights, never mind anybody else. They're committed to violence. <laughs> those are good guys. Those are the bad guys. The job of the Israeli government is to protect its citizens from the bad guys. That's my short version of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. <laughs> and while I get into all that, I would just ask <laughs> yeah. intervention. Uh, if it's based on self-interest, I think we can probably, we can certainly justify the Second World War, we can probably justify uh, annihilating ISIS, as we as we did, over the weekend, which is great. We can possibly justify elements of the Cold War. I don't know, it's difficult to know how far you, you push it. But I think, as a slight provocation, you can probably make the same case for the welfare states and for looking after the poorest people in your society, because if uh, you allow those inequalities to um, be exacerbated, and certainly the perception, if not the reality, of unfairness to take hold, um, you are likely to have your democracy toppled. So I think there is an element of self-interest in looking after other people in your own country, um, because ultimately the, the capitalism and democracy is fragile. So let me let me <laughs> let me first say. I'm not a fan of using the term democracy, um, just because I, I don't believe in democracy, qua majority rule, I know. But, um, <laughs> you know, which is, which is uh, uh, so I believe in individual rights. I, I don't believe that you can vote to silence me. I don't believe you can vote to take my money away from me. I don't believe you should be able to vote to regulate my business. So I don't believe a majority has power over the individual. I believe in a, in a state that defines clearly the rights, the freedoms of individuals, and then leaves them alone, no matter how people vote. Sure, we should vote for who's prime minister. But the role of prime minister should be so um, minor. Politicians should be so powerless that voting for the prime minister is not that big of a deal. Who really cares? Um, unfortunately, not that way in the world we live in today, right? So, uh, and then... I do believe that we, we should care about the very poor or the, the people. And I think voluntarily we can deal with that. I don't think you can voluntarily, uh, in any kind of way, deal with foreign, uh, foreign wars. Now, I, I will well, say... Well, most of them are around. Yeah, yes, I think I think should all be paid for. So, I think... Uh, for a I, I think, think all, 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 all armies should be volunteer. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Yes. I mean, literally, just a, a mob of people saying, I want to go to Syria, so all these guys are... Not even like the official Her Majesty's Army. No, I think Her Majesty should do it, but it should be a volunteer army. Hmm. So people should have to volunteer. So I don't believe in a draft in the United hmm. States, even for World War II. I don't believe, in, more radical, I don't believe in a draft in Israel. As somebody who was the victim of a draft in Israel, who spent three years in the Israeli army, um, I don't believe in a draft. I believe that a country that cannot raise a volunteer army to defend itself doesn't deserve to exist. 
So Israel should have a volunteer army. I think it will be big enough to defend Israel. I think Israel would benefit from a professional army rather than a, than a, than a, a, a inscripted army. Um, I, think, I think when you're talking about force, everything should be on a voluntary basis. So, yes, the government should decide to go to Syria to destroy ISIS, but the people actually going risking their lives should be people who volunteer to do it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, my question about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just talking then about unelected kind of governments with power being a good thing uh, in some ways. Yeah. Uh, when you think about uh, Europe as it is today, that's often a criticism uh, of it and many of the decisions that it makes don't align with the concept of a free market, right? So I just wonder about your perspective. So my, you know, my view of the European Union is uh, I think some of what this unelected body has done it's fantastic, right? I, I'm a huge believer in the free movement of capital, labor, and goods. And that there should be zero tariffs and zero controls over those freedoms. Um, and I think to the extent that the European Union had stuck to that, then that would be fantastic. And, and I'd say stay in the European Union if that was it, right? The problem, of course, is that because those are all rights-respecting policies, those are pro-freedom policies. The problem is that the European Union also engages in rights violating policies. And at some point, the balance between the good stuff and the bad stuff probably tilted towards the bad stuff. You Europeans probably know this better than I do. Right? So the regulations, the controls, the, the, the courts, the, the imposing their laws on every, every state, bad law. It would be one thing if they were imposing good laws. Bad laws, or lack of freedom of speech, all these things. Um, have now tilted, I think, the balance away from the European Union. Maybe. I, I'm still not convinced because I have a feeling that what you will do when you leave the European Union will actually make it worse, right? You'll, you'll, you'll have the worst of all worlds. You'll, you'll lose the free trade and free movement of capital and so on, and you'll keep all the regulations, controls, and lack of free speech, right? Which I think is, what, is the way you're trending. But at least you'll have an option by electing a different government, maybe, to eliminate all that, or by electing a socialist government and make it even worse. I, I don't know what guys are going to do. Um, so to me, Brexit is not all good. Brexit, Brexit just gives you now the opportunity to make it worse or to make it better. And truthfully, I don't trust you. <laughs> I don't trust anybody, right? Because generally in the world now, with a few exceptions, they go, oh, I, I, what worries me about European Union is not that they're, under, they're doing things under the left here. Yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan of democracy to begin with. Uh, what bothers me about, about the European Union is they're doing bad things and they're unelected. At least doing bad things, you should be elected. Right? <laughs> but bad things are bad things, right? And when, you're, when you elect people and they do bad things, you can at least vote them out of power. Here, they do bad things and there are no consequences. And that's, that's really bad. Can I chip in on Brexit? Oh, I'm sure you know a lot more than you on this Well, I mean, I, I share many of your concerns. Obviously, there's no uh, obvious reason to assume it's going to become a free market utopia um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but at least the option is on the table. Whereas with the EU, um, yeah, I'm not a massive fan of democracy either. You know, I believe in Churchill's view of it, really. Um, but the further a government is away from the people, the greater the temptation to centralise, to bureaucratise, to regulate, and keep everything under the sun. And that's been the way with the European Union. That is, I would say, guaranteed to get worse, whereas in this country there's only maybe 50-50% chance yeah. it'll, it'll um, get worse. So I think well, what a lot of Remainers don't realise about people who vote Brexit is it wasn't just a vote on the way the European Union is now, which has plenty of flaws, but I agree it also has uh, many benefits. It's a question of, we're not going to get this chance again. What, where do we think this thing is going to be like in 20, 30, 40 years' time? Uh, and people who voted for the EEC in 1975 had no idea what it would turn into. The centralising tendency is absolutely in the DNA of the European Union. And it's the fear about what will happen if we, if we stay in. Because we'll certainly never get another chance, I don't think, now. Um, and so when people who voted Remain say that people who voted Brexit say you don't know what you voted for, no, Remainers didn't know what they voted for, I have no idea what they voted for. Um, and so I think that is 
uh, for me, a very important point that, yes, it, t it takes a certain amount of speculation uh, uh, about where the thing is heading, but the direction of travel is very, very clear. It is away from national democracy. It is, generally speaking, towards a more Jewish economy. And although things are by no means great in Britain, I would argue that Britain actually does have a tradition of a kind of fairly fluffy capitalism and, and democracy whereas a lot of Europe has a tradition of communism and fascism. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll expand on Chris's point there as well. Um, I think the issue with the EU is culturally it's a recent expansion. So a lot of post-communist states in the mid to late 2000s, like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, joined the EU. These lack any sort of culture of freedom, capitalism and rights. So surely there's that fundamental essence of cultural incompatibility there that makes the EU well, I would say it's those countries you need to worry about. Yeah, exactly. The countries I'm much more worried about France and Germany than I am about Yeah, exactly. There's the countries in Eastern Europe who have actually really suffered under um, non-party states. They tend to bounce back fairly well. Unfortunately, in places like the UAE, they now seem going the other way. But at least they have that, that memory what it's like. It's the countries that never quite had um, full socialism like France that are, that are the, uh, the danger, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't... I, I think I think this whole cultural issue is, it, 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 you know, I know it's a it's a big deal. But, you know, I think that I think it's what makes Europe problematic is that you worry too much about these things. Um, if if you have a good culture, the good cultures will win out. If you're willing to defend that culture, and you will, if you're willing to defend that culture, and you're willing to stand up for that culture, and I think uh, Eastern Europe is actually a place where I see more <coughs> interest in capitalism, in freedom, in good ideas than they do in places like Italy and France and Spain and, and even Germany. Uh, and remember, most of the bad stuff that's happened in Europe for the last uh, 250 years has originated in Germany. So uh, while it's true that the Eastern Bloc took the Marxist, the German Marxist idea seriously, um, it did originate there. Right? So the ideas came from there. So I, I you know, I think I think that would not be my concern about about uh, about the opinion. My concern, I agree with, I agree completely. It's the the direction they're heading, they're heading towards: more statism, more centralization, more authoritarianism, more authoritarianism. Uh, and Britain has a chance to escape that. Again, the question is, will it take it? But at least you have an option. You bought an option. I'm a finance guy. Options have value. And therefore, Brexit certainly has a positive view in that sense. You always want to have options. You should ask this, people who haven't, yeah. Um, just going back to what you meant earlier, I don't fully understand why you're saying that an action motivated by guilt rather than what you define as rational self-interest makes it immoral. So in the case of the child in the river, if I find it in my rational self-interest to save that kid, then it's moral. But if I do it out of guilt, then it's immoral. I don't really understand that distinction. I also don't understand who we are to tell someone, actually, you're not doing this out of rational self-interest to serve altruism. Well, I'm not. I'm not telling them how they're doing it. I'm asking them why you're doing it. So I'm. I'm not in a position to tell somebody else what what motivated them to do them. But you can ask them because most people don't think they should act in their own self interest. So I'll never tell you I acted in my self interest because they don't think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very important why you do stuff, not just what you do. I, I'm not a consequentialist in in ethics. I think a lot of it has to do with your motivation. I don't think the two are. You know, uh, uh, and and stick to one another. I think that to go hand in hand, but I think I think why you do something is relevant because what is ethics about? Ethics is a, is about it's a it's a it's a code of ethics to guide your life. It's to guide your life in a particular direction, in, in the direction of good, in the direction of of in my view, in making your life the best life that it can be. It's principles to help you live the best life that you can live. So then the question is. Is in this action, have you applied the principles or not, right? If you've applied them, then it's moral because, you know, you've, you've done something that adds to your good life, adds to what it means to be a good person. If you haven't, I'm not saying it's immoral, but it might be amoral. You haven't done the things that add to the good life. Um, and, and that's the standard in the end. It's not the actual action that is morally immoral. It's did add to making you 
live a better life or not. And only you can decide that. I'm not going to have the mall police, right, <laughs> going around telling, oh, you, you, you know, that might have been nice, but you did it for the wrong reasons and so on. That's, that's not, my point as an educator is to try to educate people, to give them the tools to make the right decisions and to help them live their good life. Yes, you want to? not feeling guilty will improve your quality. Yeah, so, so let's talk about guilt for a second, right? So there are two types of guilt, earned guilt and unearned guilt. Sometimes you do stuff that you should feel guilty about, bad stuff. And then rationally what you should do is try to do something that redeems you, whatever that happens to be. Maybe it's to feel sorry, maybe, but it, you know, maybe it's to give some money away to compensate for somehow the two are related. I don't know how. It has to be something related to the action that you took for which you feel guilty. But this idea of unknown guilt, which I think dominates our culture, I think most people feel guilty for something they haven't done. Indeed, the opposite. I think a lot of people feel guilty for their virtues, for the good things that they have done. Then the rational thing to do is question the guilt. It's to undo the, the bad guilt that you feel. Psychologically, you, sh you want to get to the position where you don't have to feel the guilt. You're not going to reduce it by saving, by giving the money away. You're going to reduce it by rethinking your values and rethinking whether you should be guilty or not. By re-evaluating what your virtues are. So would you say it's similar to, say, if you have an alcoholic who's feeling terrible yeah. because he hasn't drank in a while, yeah. would you, are you saying that giving the money to the charity out of guilt is like giving him another drink, whereas getting rid of the unearned guilt is like sort of clearing the alcohol? It's not a perfect analogy, but it's not bad. Yeah, it's very similar. In the back. Yeah. So I've been reading that your parents. Yeah. So I've been reading that your parents, they were founders of one of the kibbutz places in Israel. No. No, my parents at some point wanted to live in a kibbutz. When they first emigrated to Israel, they, they wanted to live in a kibbutz. They Never did actually. Luckily for me. Okay. So, uh, I think that they have socialistic views, yeah, and that you you read some of my Angram school. I was one of those few who read out the shrug that it changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was wondering if you tried to engage in a conversation about those new values that you heard with my parents, heard, and maybe if you managed to convert them to Mendism. So yes and no. So when I read Atlas Shrugged, I was 16 years old, like most obnoxious 16-year-olds who read Atlas Shrugged, or most people who read Atlas and then become obnoxious 16-year-olds. <laughs> um, I thought I just discovered the truth. And it was my job in my life to convince everybody and you around me of the truth, even though I didn't know what the truth was, and I was just a 16-year-old, you know. Um, so I was an obnoxious teenager who went around arguing with everybody about yeah. Atlas Shrugged and about objectivism and about capitalism about this stuff. And I'm sure I did a lousy job and I'm sure it was obnoxious to be around. Um, a nice 16 year old who, were, you know, who I, I can identify as doing the same thing. And I yelled in my pencils, you know, that's what you do uh, when you argue in, in Israel. And it had zero impact. I mean, um, now my parents are not socialist anymore, but that's, I, I think, primarily not because of me but because of reality, because of the world. Socialism <coughs> failed. And I think most people, most people realize that socialism failed. And most, there's no left in Israel. It's, it's interesting. In Israel, um, there's no political left anymore. The political left is tiny and significant. Because socialism was tried a long time and significant. Because socialism was tried a long time ago. And <coughs> it sucked. And Israel's, Israel's kind of a fun place to live in right now. Because there's no, there's no socialism. There's still some. But it's it's less socialist. Um, what happens to um, what happens to socialists when they abandon socialism is is become cynics, right? In other words, they become they're no absolutes. There's no ideal because my ideal failed, therefore they cannot have any ideals. And their attitude towards me, a lot of the time, is yeah, you think you know stuff. I mean, you know, what do you know? It's not that they have an argument, right? It's just they don't like my certainty. And a lot of you don't like my certainty. Like I say, that's evil. People are like, whoa. 
you know, you can't say that. They don't like my, they don't like the philosophy, so they're not socialist, but they're, they're not capitalist either. The and, and you know, have I had some impact? Maybe at the margin a little bit, but but not not a lot of impact. And generally, my advice to young people is, don't try to convert your parents. It's a waste of time, <laughs> and you've probably got a decent relationship, a good relationship with your parents. Don't spoil it. Just <laughs> your That's a valuable relationship you'll enjoy through your life. You, you can actually have friends and have a relationship with people with whom you disagree. It's okay to disagree, right? Not everybody in the world has to be with you on everything. So don't be obnoxious. Don't be me when I was 16. <laughs> I mean, countries in the world that have done an okay job implementing them, and, and you know those countries. I mean, whether it's Singapore and Hong Kong that it does it in the realm of economics, but not in the realm of, of other freedoms. So right? you, you, you want to be careful in Singapore what you say and whether you chew in the street. Um, in Hong Kong now, the Chinese are climbing on a lot of other freedoms, and, and also on economic freedom. When you go to Hong Kong, they laugh at the idea that the second freest country in the world because they don't feel that way, right? Maybe because they remember what it was 20 years ago when they really were. Um, the United States and the UK <coughs> in the 19th century came pretty close to it and, and have abandoned much of it, I think, over, over time. Um, so I, I, I think, and you know, New Zealand's in fairly good shape, or at least, uh, you know, New Zealand's in fairly good shape, or at least, uh, you know, economically, and again, Ireland, I don't know, your neighbor over here? Pretty cool. I, I look at the numbers, and like they're richer than you guys. Yeah. They're much richer than, than the UK is now on a GDP per capita basis. They've got well, lower that's taxes. Just, the statistics are not reliable. They've got a bit of corporate basis. They've got well, lower taxes. Just, the statistics are not reliable. They've got a bit of corporate tax, corporate tax scam going on right now. Yeah. Cool. Really, I mean, I'm really, I'm really for, I'm for corporate taxes. So, um, they have forty percent GDP. Okay, so maybe the number the world's Okay, so maybe the number the world's the world's airlines are based in Ireland, technically, along with Apple, Google. So maybe Ireland's cheating, but but Switzerland's in pretty good. Anyway, the things that are fairly good. But Switzerland's in pretty good. Anyway, the things that are fairly good. But none of them are capitalist fully. And, and, there, and there's a reason for that, and indeed most of them are moving away from capitalism. You know, the only country right now moving towards capitalism, we'll see if it actually happens, maybe, I'm hopeful, is her country, which is Brazil. Uh, Brazil is interesting, what's going on right now in Brazil is worth watching. Uh, we'll see if it happens, fingers crossed. Uh, and I think the reason is uh, what I said in the beginning. I, I, I think that the moral code that all of us carry with us from childhood is consistent with socialism, consistent with statism, and we drift in that direction. The economists push us back, reality pushes us back, and then we drift back towards the socialism, and then the reality pushes us back towards capitalism, which is the only thing that works. Until we figure out a moral code, I think we have, but until we adopt a moral code consistent with capitalism, that actually, where we made it, we also feel good about it, uh, until we do that, we'll all, always go like this. So you guys went to socialism, and then you got Thatcher moved a little bit towards capitalism, then you drifted back towards socialism. Now, I'm not sure where you're going to go. It's not clear. Um, you might drift further towards socialism before you drift back towards capitalism, but you're drifting, and it's all this. And generally, that drift leans left, leans towards more statism. And America is the same way. Again, but, and, and even the Democrats were relative free marketists, and that drifted back towards the left. And today in America, I mean, don't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the bit that I mean, it's, the, it's morality. To me, everything at the end of the day is about morality. It's about as long as we hold altruism as this, you know, as a moral code and ideal. Not that we live it, nobody lives it. But as, a, as an ideal, and I agree about Mother Teresa, but I think that's why she was a saint. I think she was a saint because she was a miserable, pathetic, horrible human being. I think most saints are. I mean, you can be happy.
happy and be a saint, right? This, that, that is inconsistent. You, you don't go to museums and see paintings of saints smiling and having a good time. <laughs> because that's against Satan. Into this anti self interest. It's not about helping other people. If helping other people with the standard of morality, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos would be on the Mount Rushmore of morality. We'd already have sainted them. We'd already, because they helped humanity. They've helped the poor more than any philanthropist, more than any government, more than any charity has. And, and I'm not, again, not against charity, but charity didn't bring a lot of poverty. If you look 300 years ago, all of us were poor. Today, from an absolute level, almost none of us support. Eight percent of the world population is poor. Why? Because of the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the great industrialists of, of the UK. But none of them are saints. But they should be. They're the real saints. The real moral heroes. And when we have a society that doesn't view the great industrialists of the nineteenth century as robber barons, Use them as moral, not just in, in, in financial, but moral heroes. When we think of Jeff Bezos, put aside the sex, as a moral <laughs> hero, <laughs> then I think we'll be ready for capitalism. <clears throat> but we won't until we're willing to do that. They are the great people in our society. Not because they're philanthropy. Their philanthropy is nice, but they're moral heroes because of the wealth that they create. So what about the truth of you? Well, the, I, I recommend Christopher Hitchens' book on Mother Teresa. Yeah. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. What did she do? Theory, I, 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 you, okay, I'll we need to wrap it up. So who hasn't asked a question? Okay, so we're going to take these four questions, and you're going to do short questions, and we're going to try to be quick. Okay, start there. Um, so my question was about money and altruism. What, what do you think about money in, in terms of like what we're using right now? Uh, you get a lot of... Uh, if, if, in fact, the more exact way to put this question is, do you think the money we have right now, by decree, is consistent with capitalism? I think that maybe... So, so my answer is no, it's not consistent with capitalism. I don't believe in fiat money. I don't believe the government should control the money supply or, or the of money or anything to do with money. I think the Bank of England's abomination that destroyed free banking in Scotland and, and destroyed it in the name of power, in the name of control. So uh, it's not. But on the other hand... For the most part, people who make money are making money because they're producing God. But would you say, like, maybe if we had a more objective money introduced, something underlined by a commodity, maybe then uh, all the banking institutions we have now, you know, it's sort of like an altruistic... They would, have to be they would have to be completely different if, if, the, if the money supply was privatized. Banking would be a diff very different than it is today. Today, there are public utilities. They're so heavily regulated. They basically do what the government tells them to do. And that's why the financial <coughs> price being caused by capitalism is such a joke. Yes. Because this is the most regulated industry in the entire universe. And, <coughs> yeah, and it, so they did what their incentives and what the regulatory structure encouraged them to do. Which is screwy. Right. That's what the regulations encouraged them to do. Uh, okay, yeah. Is there a chance for government innovation? And is that government's innovation or the creation of new, the creation and application of new ideas? Would it need to have its own city as the gods got? <coughs> if the answer is yes, why has all of the experiments from the one that exists in Chile to the first project in New Hampshire to Liberland in, in Serbia, all of those intention communities or attempt to create a world for capital? or for libertarians, uh, have massively failed throughout history. Because, as you've already seen tonight, libertarians can't agree on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so how can you get a bunch of them together and expect it to work out, especially in some bit of swamp like Liberland and all these <laughs> freestanding things? Um, it's a lovely idea, but there's going to be an element of kind of Lord of the Flies to it. <laughs> well, it's not even on the idea the way these people perceive it. You, you really think that at a plot of land contest between Arnold <coughs> Bosnia and Serbia, Anybody's going to let you build a country? I mean, really? As soon as you build anything, one of those countries... And I remember the president, the president in quotes, of, of Liberal Land, you know. And I said, as soon as you succeed, a little bit going to invade. He said, no, no, no. CNN will be there. They won't let it happen. I said, CNN was there when the Soviets and the Bosnians and the Croatians slaughtered each other in mass. And nobody gave them. You think... Libertarians are... And I, often I don't call myself a libertarian for this, right? I don't call myself a libertarian. They're so divorced from actual reality, from the way people actually behave in real life, 
Uh, the, none of these, you know, they, uh, there's a famous story of the libertarians who planted a, a flag on an atoll in Fiji, and two days later the king of Fiji with a few troops came and kicked them off, right? <laughs> there's a reality, there's a real world out there, it's not inside your head. And it, the only way to bring about a better world is through education, it's through changing people's minds, and it's through, you know, working what we do, right? writing books, <laughs> educating. There's no shortcuts. There's just no shortcuts. And I don't think there's innovation in government, not on a big scale. The, the, the big innovation was done in the Enlightenment, and that is the idea that individuals have rights and that the job of government is to protect them. And the U.S. government was a massive innovation. If we had a government that was established in, in, in the Constitution in the, in the 18th century, we'd be pretty good today. The problem is nobody cares about the Constitution in the beginning. It's a piece of paper with no meaning. The Supreme Court decides every few days how, how it will interpret it only tomorrow based on democracy. Are we do about democracy, and isn't that extremely inefficient to spend your life uh, convincing the 51 or the largest majority to adopt your plan, then to execute it so that eventually... But there is no land here. This is why I like <coughs> colonizing Mars and colonizing the moon. But if you think that the powers to be, again, your politics, right? If you think that the powers to be are going to get laissez-faire capitalism established on Mars on the moon, you should read The Moon as a Harsh Mistress by Robert Henlein. I mean, you be, as soon as they establish semi-freedom on Mars, on, on the moon, it's on a spaceship to the next planet, because he knows the status is coming and they're going to destroy <laughs> his newfounded uh, capitalist <laughs> ideal. Unless a significant number of people believe our ideas, our ideas will fail. Uh, I've told the little <coughs> land, I've told all these materials, the bad guys have nukes. <laughs> and the bad guys believe, really, really believe, that using force to impose their will is okay. The whole modern state is built on that idea. So why do you think they're going to let you have a little goat somewhere where you can do whatever the hell you want? There's no way that the Marines are going to show up and they are going to shut you down as soon as you achieve anything. Imagine a free bank on one of these islands, right? A free bank that does not play by the Federal Reserve's rules, that does not believe that it's money laundering to use drug money because we believe in drug organization, right? So drugs are okay. How long do you think the U.S. government is going to let you run that bank before the Marines show up and shut you down? I mean, again, you have to be, you have to focus on reality. And reality suggests that unless we get a, a large enough group of people and at least one nuke pointed at Washington, D.C., you'll never get it. You should assure destruction has worked. Okay, last two questions, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to go back to the altruism bit. Um, and I think you're falling in a contradiction when you're saying that uh, you should use this framework and this method of uh, self-interested rationality to a values, which is guilt, or the feeling a duty of... Um, guilt is not a value. Guilt is a disjunct. Well, guilt, guilt might, you might call it more, but it's the result of a value that something that you're doing, okay. you evaluate it in a way that makes you, you feel guilt. So that's something that um, Chris mentions uh, in his assessments of the public health law and how they confuse different uh, values in terms of self-interest and some people value more health, some people value more pleasure they get out of it. Yeah. And both are okay, but then you have this view that some of it is not okay. So if, what, what if someone uses the rational self-interest to decide that it's okay to feel and if, if I can help other people I should feel so, guilty about it? So, you know, guilt is a negative emotion. It creates stress, it creates... Uh, I don't... That's just not a positive. It's just not moving you towards a happy, prosperous, successful life. Um, so nobody, it's, it's like all the people out there who are masochists, who um, enjoy pain, in quotes, enjoy pain. And therefore you would say it's an irrational self-interest to whip them three times a day. Yeah, but they're sick. They're, a healthy animal doesn't do that. We're, we're animals. A healthy animal doesn't. So yes, there are some people that are just, Perverse. There's certain people who get pleasure out of killing other people. I mean, you see these serial killers, they really seem to get pleasure out of it, right? Now, they're abnormal sick human beings. You don't structure society, you certainly don't structure a moral code around sickness. You structure it around health. Most people don't want to feel, don't want to pursue the negative emotions. Not unless there's a, 
you know, you might pursue a negative emotion if there's a, a better goal, something even better, more to achieve. But look, life is life is complicated. I'm not, none of this is easy. I always tell people, if you want to be selfish, selfish in, in the Randy sense of the term, it's hard work. It requires really thinking about the trade-offs, what values you want to pursue, at what expense, how much you're willing to invest in it, how you know what kind of how hard you're willing to work at this particular thing. Is the guilt I feel earned or unearned? Psychology is hard. You have to care about your psychological health. Do I want to smoke because I get pleasure out of it? What's the chances that I get lung cancer? All of those are decisions you have to make, and the more responsibilities are you to make them. And I'm saying, yeah, make them. It's not easy, and I'm not there to, to, to I might judge you, but I'm not going to dictate how you should make your choices. But you have to, and you're going to make mistakes about it. Right? So life is not simple. It's not easy. It's about making the difficult choices, about thinking through. What I want to do is get people thinking about these these things. I don't think most think about because they're not allowed. They don't allow themselves because they've been taught to think about what's good for you. is selfish and therefore outside the realm. They want to be good. Everybody wants to be good. Everybody wants to be moral, justifiable. And I want to ex- I want to introduce them to a new way of thinking about what morality is. Last one. Yeah, so my question is, uh, you're talking about this philosophy, and I think it's very beautiful. Can you talk about how an ideal society looks like? <laughs> yeah. You finish yeah, it's easy, right? Um, an, ideal, an ideal society from a, from a, an ideal society is a society where there's no coercion, um, or, or where coercion is outlawed, and where there is a government that does base one thing, protect individual rights, which means it has a police force, a military, and a judicial System to arbitrate disputes between us and to, and to bring criminals to justice. Um, it means that all of that has to be funded and, uh, and organized voluntarily. And it means that it's a society in which we can only legitimately interact with one another on a voluntary basis. Through, you know, I can't force you to do anything. Um, I think a society like that is beautiful. I think, that, you know, it's a society of people pursuing their own self-interest in a variety of different ways. We're all different. They all have different values. I think a society like that has a safety net, but I don't think it's government safety net. I think it's a voluntary safety net. I think that safety net has a lot to do with insurance, but also has an element of charity that, that supports those who cannot afford insurance, which I think is a fraction of 1%, so I think you don't need a lot of charity to take care of them because in a robust insurance market, I think prices decline, including healthcare. Um, and, you know, it's a society of people uh, are, are motivated by their own self-interest and they're pursuing their own values. It's a society that values money, but also values spiritual values, the arts. I think, I think, that, I think the complete set of, of real human values that make a human being the best that he can be. And, you know, I, I'm sad that I'll never see such a society, but I think it's a, it's a beautiful ideal to fight for. I second that. Yeah, so I guess that's... uh, Thanks, guys.